Hi, everybody. Welcome to our session on Divi's Labs. This is going to be our second session. So if you missed the first session, um, you can find that on our YouTube channel. So you may be a little lost um, if you haven't watched that session. So I recommend that after you watch this, go back and watch that first session for sure. Um, a couple of administrative things before we kick into the presentation and the material for today. Uh, we are working on a tool that I think will be really good for our members uh, to help them evaluate uh, small cases in a very objective and fair manner. So we love the small case website and platform, as many of you know, and we've recommended that a lot of our members use it. But one of the areas where we feel that the small case platform may fall a little short is giving transparency on small case performance and uh, helping you benchmark um, you know, and find the right small case for you. So we're working on tools for our members to make that a lot easier. So the first uh, draft of that tool will probably be released this week. So look forward to hearing feedback from you guys, whether you like the tool, how we can make it better, et cetera. So keep your eyes uh, peeled out for that and look forward to hearing your thoughts on um, if it helps you in your decision making or not. Uh, great. So with that little preliminary, now we'll get into the material for today. So today we'll be continuing our exploration of the top 150 stocks in India. And uh, look, this is the actual analysis that I'm using to help me make uh, judgments about what stocks I want in the small case and how big of a position I want in those stocks. Um, so it's a great ex uh, experience for me to allow you to see the process that I kind of go through and that we've gone through in fundamentals firms that I've worked at to analyze stocks and try to figure out if they're uh, good bets or not. Uh, one big, big uh, caveat and warning for people, look, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what's going to happen. Our job as investors is to make educated guesses, right? So, um, you know, I'll be discussing views about stocks in these series. That doesn't mean, you know, you should act on those views. You should always look at the material presented, think critically about it, see if you agree, disagree. That's what good investing is all about. It's using your own judgments to, uh, to make decisions. So hopefully what you'll take away from these series is not what Sahil is saying about this stock, but what is the thought process? What are the tools I used? What are the judgments that I'm uh, making? Are those fair or not? Can you use these tools to help you research your own stocks? That is really what the series is intended to uh, give to people. So hopefully um, that's what you take out of it. Um, great. So let's carry on. So uh, last time we uh, covered the following. So we understood the basics about what Divi's Labs was. We understood that it was an API manufacturer. So that's basically an outsourced manufacturer of active pharmaceutical ingredients. So what does that mean? That basically means when you buy a pill, you're buying the final formulation. And what Divi's is doing is they're making a piece of that pill, the active ingredient of that pill. So they're making a very important part of the final formulation and they're doing it on an outsourced basis for their customers. So you can think of them as any sort, sort of contract manufacturer in any kind of supply chain. Um, we looked at the company's financials and we were pretty impressed at a high level about its margins. The company was operating with 60% gross margins. Um, and for anyone that's confused at the terms I'm throwing, recommend you look at our stock zero to hero series first. That will explain all these terms, but I'm just going to assume people kind of know what these terms mean now. So gross margins of 60%, which are good, very, very good. And they were operating with operating margins of 30% plus, which is also fantastic. So what does that tell us about Divi's? It's telling us that for every rupee that they're taking in in revenue, they're converting a lot of that rupee into final bottom line profit, which means that their customers are willing to pay a premium for their services. Otherwise, they wouldn't allow Divi's to create so much profit 
uh, and they would drive down prices, etc. So it's telling us that Divi's is adding substantial amount of value to its customers. That's one inference that I took from the Divi's numbers. We understood the recent trends in the business. So we saw that Divi's um, had a very good quarter and uh, grew top line at a very, very high rate. Um, some of that was due to lumpiness, but there were also some strong organic trends in the business as customers shifted away from China and more towards other sources of supply in the market. So that set up a very intriguing possibility for us. Um, we also looked at the valuation of Divi's and we realized it's very expensive, right? So it's trading at a, you know, uh, you know, 50, 60 times PE, which is high uh, by any measure. The average PE in, uh, in the Nifty is around 20. So it's an expensive stock. So we took a judgment call at the end of the first series. Is this stock too expensive to do additional work on or do we actually want to explore it further? And I was sort of intrigued because I said that, look, the macro setup is quite interesting for Divi's. Uh, we all know that Atma Nirbhar is a key focus. People are trying to figure out how to move away from China as a sourcing channel uh, because of political reasons. Could this be a great beneficiary of that? This is a manufacturer. This is India based. They're um, clearly doing a good job of manufacturing. Could there be secular tailwinds in this industry that justifies such a high PE ratio? So in this session, we're going to explore that thesis to see if it's right or wrong and whether we want to carry on with an investment in Divi's or not. So that's kind of the setup. So I covered a lot of the material here. So I'm just going to carry on from the slide. Okay. So we also discussed in the last session, um, a plan for due diligence in Divi's. What are the key questions that we're going to need to answer as we formulate a view on whether we like this as an investment or not? Well, a lot of our investment thesis comes down to what's going on in the API manufacturing market. What do the dynamics look like with China versus India? Who are Divi's competitors in India? What is the risk of MNCs actually saying, you know what, we don't want to outsource API manufacturing. We actually want to do the whole thing in-house. In, in That's also a, a source of competition. If they say we're, we're just going to build our own plants and do it, right? So you really want to understand the API market and what's going on and whether it's favorable or not. And then the second part is, once we understand that, what are the implications to Divi's of that analysis? What does that mean in terms of Divi's revenue? How would that translate into their earnings per share? And what does the PE ratio look like under those scenarios? So that's kind of the game plan. And then finally, if all of these check out, what are the risks of investing in Divi's? Even though if everything checks out, everything looks good, we're ready to make an investment, you know, you always have to do the final check of what could I be missing? What could go wrong such uh, and that I need to be cognizant of as I'm putting money into a stock, right? Everything could look great, but then Divi's runs into problems with FDA approval, right? And then your investment is in trouble. You need to know that the, those risks exist if, you're, if you were to proceed. And then finally, uh, if all of this checks out, what are our next steps? So we're going to cover this uh, diligence flow today. Okay. So the first step that I took in sort of trying to answer these questions was figuring out what data I had at my hands to draw inferences and conclusions from, because I don't know much about the pharma industry. It's not an industry where I've uh, invested in the past uh, in, a, in large ways, right? I've taken small, small positions here and there in pharma, but never made a conviction bet in pharma. So it's something I really needed to study, really needed to understand that at a level that was far more detailed than what I knew going in. So, um, so really what I did was uh, whenever you're trying to learn about a new industry, you got to use Google and you got to see what is out there. And I found a fantastic report on the API industry that KPMG released, which really helped me get my arms around the um, the, the dynamics and we'll post that uh, report alongside this video on the learn section in case you want to download the report and read it yourself. So members can look for that on the, on the website uh, once it's uploaded. But 
let's say that report didn't exist because that report made my life a lot easier in terms of learning the industry. But let's say it didn't exist. Would I be stuck? The answer is no. Now with Google, there's so much at your disposal. So whether it's trade association websites or news articles or interviews with the management teams of companies or company websites or somebody's blog post where they've done their own analysis on, on the sector, there are so many places that you can, you can go to find information on sectors that were uh, very obscure to you before. And this is great for all of us as investors. It means that we can start learning about industries that previously we would have no hope of learning about, right? So really, really use Google to your advantage. You'll find great stuff like, you know, I happened to find when I was doing the research on Denise. Okay, so we found the sources that I'm gonna use. So the approach I'm gonna follow again is understand the dynamics of uh, the API market. Then I wanna understand how quickly the market is going to grow in the future. I wanna understand, is there a step change? It was growing at this rate in the past, but because of all the secular tailwinds, it's actually gonna grow at 1.5 times faster. That's the kind of thing I'm looking for when I'm looking to justify the V's PE ratio. Because if I can't find that, then the V's PE ratio looks expensive, right? So, so that's kind of the approach here. So let's, let's walk into the, the first set of the due diligence. So let me just, one thing I wanna just turn on my pointer so I can call out things as we go through this. Okay, so first thing I did was I tried to understand the API market at a global level. Where is the manufacturing done of APIs currently? How much of it is done in India, China, you know, and how much of it is still done in high cost regions, right? So learned a few things. One, it's a big market. It's a 170 billion US dollar global market. And while manufacturing has been moving quickly abroad, there is still a very sizable chunk of the market that's still being produced in high cost regions. So if we look at USA, 28% of the manufacturing facilities of APIs are still sitting in the US. 26% of them are still sitting in the EU. These are very high cost jurisdictions for manufacturing. This is actually a very good thing as we think about the API market for prospects for India and China, because there's still a lot of manufacturing that could potentially move from these high cost geographies to lower cost geographies. Second thing I noted is that India and China have a pretty uh, sizable share and roughly equal share of the manufacturing facilities, um, which is also an interesting data point. So if we do believe that people are going to try to move supply chains from China to India, there's actually a sizable chunk of the market that could shift and again, provide a tailwind for Indian manufacturers of APIs. So one of the theses that we had going into uh, part one was that the reason people are moving manufacturing to India and China is because it's much, much cheaper and that kind of holds. So essentially, if we look here, there are a couple of reasons that my research revealed why manufacturers were moving to these regions. One is environmental liabilities. Manufacturing these uh, products, uh, you have to comply with environmental regulations that tend to be very costly to comply with in the US and Europe and easier to comply with in India and China. The standards are a little less uh, strict and more easy to comply with in India and China. So that's one reason. But the more important reason, as we hypothesized in part one, is there is a huge labor cost arbitrage. The cost of labor, in, if we peg that at 100 in the US, that same cost of labor in India and China for producing APIs would be 10 in India, and China would be eight. So it's a massively cheaper proposition to produce APIs. Uh, when you have that kind of labor cost differentials. That's why you're seeing China and India gain share in API manufacturing. Um, there are a lot of companies, uh, the largest API manufacturers are listed here. So you'll notice that Divis is not on the list. And you'll notice that a lot of these are not even Indian companies, some of them, right? A lot are Indian companies, but you have like Teva, Active Pharmaceutical Ingredients, which is an Israeli company, right? So this is a, a global market by, by all stretches. And there are several Indian players like Dr. Reddy's and Aurobindo 
supply, etc., that are that are rooted in India. So India is a significant producer. Um, and then we see that um, one of the fears I had was, are people going to insource manufacturing of APIs? And my research showed that that's very unlikely. Most people are talking about outsourcing more. So if you take a look at AstraZeneca, it's one of the largest um, uh, MNC pharma companies. It's currently manufacturing 85% of its pills in the house, but they're planning to outsource all of it over time. So this, the trend is towards more outsourcing, not less. And a lot of people expect China and India's manufacturing of APIs uh, to double. So this sounds like a really great setup at a global level, but let's peel the onion back and let's see specifically what the deal is with India, what the deal is with China, how they compare, etc. Okay, so before we do that, key takeaways from the global analysis. It's a large market. There's a strong economic reason for, produ for producers to favor India and China. That's a very good thing. Still a lot of room for manufacturing to shift towards the low cost regions. And it looks like MNCs are actually shifting towards using outsourcing. So good news on the global side. Okay, now let's move to the Indian market. Okay. So in my research on the Indian market, uh, Indian API manufacturing market, a couple of interesting uh, things to discuss. First, the advantages of the Indian market. So the technological capabilities are at par with the best. So we don't have a shortage of know-how. We have a strong chemically trained and skilled workforce that can be utilized towards manufacturing these APIs. And in general, we have very high quality manufacturing standards and reputation which is very, very important for these things. So those are the positive sides. On the negative sides, and these are also very important, we have inadequate infrastructure. So if we think about the availability of land to set up API plants, if we think about the availability of, uh, you know, stable utilities to support that land and the plants, it's just not there like it is in other regions. So that's one of India's big challenges, finding uh, spaces to set up these API parks. Another big challenge that uh, I uncovered through the research is India does not have uh, the availability of the raw materials to produce APIs in within the country. This is a big deal because you need chemicals to produce these APIs. And if India does not have them within its borders, it has to rely on sourcing these products from elsewhere. And we'll see uh, in just a few minutes where that sourcing comes from. Next challenge is we have very onerous price controls. So the government very tightly regulates what these final goods can be sold for because they want to make sure that the goods, uh, that the pills are affordable for everyone. This creates margin pressure on certain categories of APIs. And the last is, uh, last two are we have currently had low government support, though that's changing. And there's also delays in and uh, a big issue and challenge in terms of getting the permits and clearances to set up API plants. So what is the result of this? So the results are twofold. One, because we don't have the raw materials to produce APIs uh, within our borders, we actually um, import a large, large amount of raw materials and 68% of that importing is from China. So even if uh, people shift their supply chains to India, unless we have also figured out how to reduce the raw material dependency from China, ultimately they're still linking back to China and that's a big issue. Second is China is more price competitive because of all these challenges here. And we'll see that on the next slide. This was a really key data chart that I found in the research, which really needs to be studied and understood. So if we look at the cost of production index of producing APIs between India and China, a couple of very, very salient details that come out. While there's very little delta between the labor costs, in fact, this source said there was zero delta between the labor sources, but I found others saying there was a small, China was a little cheaper. Uh, but you see the big deltas are around raw materials. Again, China has these 
and is producing them themselves. India is forced to buy these second hand. So there's a big difference in the cost of uh, producing and, and using these raw materials. Second is if we look at the power and fuel, again, that's an infrastructure cost. That is also much higher in India. So the punchline is once you factor in all these costs, producing an API in India versus China, uh, India is 22% more expensive. And that is a big deal. There is a focus globally on the rising cost of healthcare. Getting these costs down is a core focus for everybody. So being a low cost manufacturer is a big, big deal. And it's very clear from this data that India is not a low cost manufacturer and actually China is significantly cheaper. So that's one significant negative finding in my research um, and, a, and something that we're going to have to think a lot about as we proceed in the analysis. Okay. The other thing that was clear was that the government was going to start pushing API manufacturing. So as we discussed, a key part of the Atman Nirbhar push is API manufacturing. This is very squarely in line with what the government wants to do. Drugs are a very important part of our national wellness. And uh, strategically, the government wants us to control more of our API manufacturing. So the goal is uh, to help the industry do that. So the government has talked about a few things, right? So one is a PLI scheme, so production linked incentive scheme for 53 APIs, KSMs and intermediates. So essentially they're trying to get these things produced within India. And uh, if this is successful, it will reduce dependency on China by 25% of total imports. So what we can do is use this 25% to calculate what the revenue pool is from this initiative. We don't know if this is going to be successful or not, but let's assume it's a hundred percent successful. How much incremental revenue could this add to our market size? So what I did is I used the number of imports, the, the value of imports that we had multiplied it by 25% uh, to figure out the incremental revenue. And that equates to a 670 million US annual revenue pool from this initiative, if it was fully successful. And if I basically just did the simple math of dividing that by the total industry size of APIs, it equates to a 5% uplift for the total industry. So we're talking about this adding roughly 5% higher sales to the Indian industry. And that's good, but it's not a game changer. Right. So we're going to have to look for more than just government support to get excited by the uh, macro picture. The other thing they talked about was creating three uh, API manufacturing parks with shared infrastructure that will help on the infrastructure side. But as we see in this chart, infrastructure is a relatively small part of the cost. One of the biggest cost areas is raw materials. And on this, we get really confident that India is going to be able to right size this raw material cost significantly. That's really uh, going to be a, a big uh, impediment to producing in India. Um, the other thing that I uh, saw was there was talk that some of these price controls could be relaxed so that manufacturers would have more flexibility in raising prices on the products. So manufacturing could become more attractive in India, but you can't bank on that because obviously drug prices are a very, very uh, key focal point for consumers and a big political issue. Now, the other thing that became very clear, China is not sitting idle while the government is trying to do all this. China is fighting back by hiking the prices of KSMs. They're, so they're basically saying, okay, you're trying to eliminate us from the supply chain. Well, we're going to raise our prices on you now. So, you know, it's not like China is sitting idle. So that's another thing to think about. Okay. So what do we learn from the India specific analysis? Um, so one thing is the Indian market has grown at a decent clip. So if we go back here and see this chart here, this is the Indian API market. So we can see that from 2016 to 2020, it's grown at an 8.6% average annual growth rate. And uh, KPMG, the reports projecting that it's going to continue growing at that 8.6% CAGR for the next four years. So they're not expecting a step change in growth. 
they're expecting it's still going to screw at the same kind of rate. So that's, a, a, again, another thing to think about. There's not evidence that there's going to be the step change. So that's one thing that uh, a key takeaway. There are definitely some key advantages to Indian manufacturing, but significant structural issues. And are the government initiatives enough to get us confident on betting on India, uh, getting a lot of share of API? My read personally, after doing this research, um, is that the Indian market will likely benefit from some share shift. It probably will grow at a, I think, a little bit faster clip than it has in the past. I disagree with KPMG. I think it will probably grow at maybe a 10% CAGR, et cetera, et cetera. But the big thing that is causing me from wanting to bet on that is that I, a, I don't see a step change. I don't see it going from 8% growth to 15% growth. I see maybe 8 to 10, right? And the second is, um, um, there are lots of structural problems that are going to have to be figured out. And I don't want to bet on those unless I see a very clear path to how these structural problems are going to be dealt with. How is India going to get the raw material prices down? How are they going to get cost competitive relative to China? You know, these are big issues that I have with my findings from the India specific analysis. So where does that leave us? Um, so I'm not willing to bank on the market growing much higher than it did in the past and rising the tide of all boats in the industry. So my investment thesis is in danger, but there is one possibility that still exists that we can investigate. Even if the market doesn't grow uh, significantly faster than it did in the past, if we believe that it will grow a little faster and more importantly, Divi's is poised to capture more market share than in the past, then investment thesis could still work. But to answer this question, we're going to have to understand where Divi's falls within the industry, how it compares to its competitors, etc. Is there some reason to believe that Divi's is going to grow faster than the market, basically? So if I looked at the information that I had, we found a chart that basically lays out how the industry looks. So just it's complicated chart. So I'll just explain it somewhat. So on the vertical axis, we have the type of market, whether it's regulated, semi-regulated or domestic. So basically uh, how uh, essentially uh, formalized the, the company is. And on the X axis, we have the focus going from commodity. So commodity meaning uh, very, a simple APIs to manufacture to very complicated APIs to manufacture. So things that require a lot of R and D and a lot of know-how and the very complicated molecules that are being made. So if you look at Divi's, it operates in the formal regulated uh, sector, right? But it's making essentially mid mid range products. They're not making commodity products that are very, very simple to make. And they're not making very, very complicated, sophisticated products. Um, and, you know, why aren't they making the simple products? Because the simple products are going to be made by cost leaders, large companies that can make these products at very low costs because they're simple products that don't need a lot of know-how and Divi's is not large enough to do that. So they're forced to focus on these mid-range products and they don't have the uh, technical abilities to make the high potency and complicated products. So as I thought about this, it made me a little concerned with Divi's differentiation in terms of positioning. And it was not, again, something that I was willing to bet on. I'm not willing to bet on Divi's gaining, uh, growing at a rate faster than the market. I don't see the unique place it's fitting in the market that leads me to believe that I can bet on that thesis. So again, looks like the thesis is in a little bit of danger. Right. So let's put it all together. Let's get our thinking clear because we've gone through a lot. Okay. So first findings, Divi's is a good company. No doubt about it. You look at the margins. This is clearly a company that's generating a lot of value. Otherwise it's customers wouldn't be, uh, again, paying those prices. Why is it getting 35% margin? Because it's adding a lot of value, but it's trading at a very high PE. 
So what we wanted to know is, is this PE justified? So we wondered, is the PE justified because of the macro tailwinds, Atma, Nirbhar, and all the other developments that we're seeing? So we formulated a hypothesis and said, let us investigate this hypothesis. We researched it objectively, went through what we could find on the market, but ultimately we were not convinced enough to bet on it. That, that is a very important statement. It doesn't mean that I think there's no chance that this will happen. It's just that I didn't feel comfortable enough to want to bet and invest money behind it because I saw too much risk to it not happening. It's, I saw too many obstacles and roadblocks, etc. So what does that mean? That means we will pass on the investment. Uh, it doesn't look like our investment hypothesis was proven out. So the PE in our view is probably not justified based on our analysis of the facts. So that leads us to a very important question. Was this a waste of time? So what you will find when you do stock research is that finding bargains is hard. If it was easy, then there would be no bargains in the market because people would price them out, right? So we know it has to be difficult to find bargains. Just like finding a great deal on a, you know, anything on a cell phone will be very hard and require lots of research. Similarly, finding great bargains on a stock was also going to be hard. So you've got to go in to research basically saying that, look, 90% of the time or 80% of the time, I won't find a bargain right when I start analyzing a company, but that's okay because we learned about a company. We learned about an industry. And even if it's not useful right now, we know how quickly prices can change in the stock market. So it's very routine to see stock prices of companies fall 30%, 40%, 50% in the market. And we know this company now, right? We know a lot about the V's. We know how we think about it. And it's quite feasible that at some point, we actually may want to invest in the V's. And I've seen this a lot in my career where I did research on a stock, didn't find the stock an attractive investment at that time, something happened and then it became a very interesting stock. So it's not a waste of time. And the more and more companies you understand like this in detail, the more you're going to be able to react properly once you've done your homework. So uh, always, you know, uh, take the long view on your time that you've spent and all these things. It's not, it's not a waste of time. Okay, so uh, before we get to Q&A next time, what are we going to do? We're going to continue the series with another top 150 stock. So if any members want to suggest a stock that we look at, you can feel free to email us at advisory at Barossa Club. Um, we're going to focus on, again, stocks in the top 150 companies in, in India by market cap. And we're going to pick stocks that we think a lot of people could benefit from. If you guys have any recommendations, please feel free to uh, suggest them to us. And um, Great, with that, I'm going to uh, open it up for Q&A. Okay, so there are a bunch of questions. Sure. Um, America wants to reshore manufacturing to USA and medicines and defense are key areas it wants to restore. Restore sure. manufacturing to USA and medicines and defense are key areas it wants to restore may not affect API manufacturers manufacturers, or will it? It's a very good question. There definitely is a push towards um, sort of towards make in America, just like there is a push towards make in India, right? Atma Nirbhar is essentially the same thing. And I think the one thing that um, makes me uh, skeptical of it being a danger to the API industry is that at the end of the day, consumers have to be able to afford the pills that are produced. And if you look at the US in particular, unlike the UK, uh, Canada, you know, healthcare is not nationalized there. They're pri it's a private payer market. And so healthcare is very, very expensive. And anything that dramatically makes it much more expensive to, for the end consumer to consume that, uh, that uh, medicine, I don't think will uh, 
carry catch on in a big way. I think I think and and for that reason, I think in particular API manufacturing is somewhat protected from that. It is a risk. I mean, you you never know for sure what's going to happen. But I think unlike some other areas, healthcare is just too expensive in the U.S. And it it as a result, I think. Um, I would be very surprised to see a lot of manufacturing shifting back to the US because it's so much more expensive. Remember that labor cost differential. It was like the difference between 100 and 8. So basically, it costs you virtually nothing to produce uh, on a labor basis in India and China relative to what you have to pay. 92% cheaper, right? So um, on, on just the labor cost basis. So uh, I, don't, I don't see that being a big issue, but it's a, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, based on your analysis of Divi's, is it likely to double in value in the next five years? Um, based on my analysis, no. That doesn't mean that it won't, right? Uh, but um, essentially, look, what did my analysis say? It said that there were uh, lots of challenges that would need to be addressed for Divi's to double in in the next five years. Um, so I do I don't personally want to bet on that, right? So that's essentially the, the thesis that I got. I liked the company. I, I do think it's a very good company, but it's just not uh, the stock is so so expensive. It needed to be a great opportunity in order for uh, this to be a solid investment. And it and my analysis suggested good opportunity, but not great opportunity. But the PE is pricing in a great opportunity. Okay. Uh, API affects environment quite a bit, which is a key reason for countries like USA to not reshore from countries like India and China, which have lower environmental standards. Correct. That is also a, uh, a good point. Um, there is a negative environmental impact to API manufacturing. And, uh, you know, the US uh, and Europe have more luxury to care about environmental impacts than India and China because of the stage of economic development. So that's yet another reason why they may be reluctant, as the listeners pointing out, to reshore. Good, good, good observation. Okay, so it seems like API is not a commodity. So some players, some Indian players, may have an edge. So which players do you think will do well? So I've got to study the players to have a concrete view. Uh, Dr. Reddy's is definitely a company that's intriguing me to do more research. Um, it's very clear that they're one of the leaders in API manufacturing. So remember, our thesis on Divi's fell flat for a couple of reasons. One, I didn't see an outsized opportunity for growth in the market. I just saw too many challenges. Uh, two, um, I didn't see the opportunity for Divi's to grow faster than the market. Uh, but that may not be true for a company like Dr. Eddie's, right? So, so Dr. Eddie's is, is a leader in the market. They may be a low cost manufacturer of APIs. They may have a structural advantage versus peers. And this is all hypothesizing because I haven't studied Dr. Eddie's in detail. But um, it is an interesting uh, candidate to potentially research and see if we can get convinced of that. And now that I know a reasonable amount about the API industry and have a sense of the dynamics, it's a, natu a naturally logical candidate uh, to, to uh, analyze because um, I can leverage the work I've done here. Yeah, maybe it's a good idea to do Dr. Reddy's next. Uh, yeah, or we can or we can do different different industries, right? So uh, I'll I'll look yes, forward to the suggestions that come. But yeah, okay. Uh, can you sh share one or two good resources that we can read regularly to improve our knowledge of stock investing? Oh, uh, let's see. Um, no, I think regular resources. The ones that I find most useful are very very high quality. Um, uh, publications. So I really like the Wall Street Journal. Um, it's a bit expensive, uh, but it has very high quality analysis and articles. Uh, second is Bloomberg. Bloomberg has also stepped up their game big time in terms of getting quality analysis around. Uh, and, um, you know, what I feel like 
the biggest danger in investing is falling into herd mentality. So I would stay away from sites that build themselves as, you know, investment clubs where we're going to share ideas and, you know, because that's a very dangerous way to fall into herd thinking and say that, you know, oh, uh, these guys are recommending Tesla as a stock, you know, so, and everyone's recommending it. So I'm also going to buy it. You know, that, that's really what you don't want to do in investing. You want to train your ability to think independently. Otherwise, you're just going to be following the market and following the market means underperforming the market because when the market goes up, you'll be late. When the market goes down, you'll be late. So you will just, you will underperform the market, right? You want to have an independent view based on independent analysis. So anything that regularly informs you about facts, data uh, is going to be good. So newspapers, publications, these are the things to spend your time understanding and then building your uh, knowledge of how to interpret financial statements. So looking at our stock zero to hero uh, videos is a good first step. Then reading some classics on uh, investing. And actually it's a good idea. We'll post uh, on our website, some recommendations for investment books that can get you into um, uh, understanding financial statement analysis, but just a few that, that are good ones. So there's one called um, One Up on Wall Street by Peter Lynch. Classic book, very, very good. Uh, and uh, another one that's uh, very good is Margin of Safety by Seth Klarman. And this book is out of print. Uh, so it may be a little tough for you to find, but you can find uh, uh, versions of it online, etc. cetera. So uh, those, are, those are two classics and I'll put some more recommendations up on the, on the website. Okay. Um, there's a question on the pharma sector index. To a great deal, it has been down for the past five years. Do you think the index has a potential upside from here? Um, you know, I think, so I think that pharma in general, there's a lot of things to like about it in terms of will the companies see growth, right? the populations are increasing, the lifespans are increasing, the usage of uh, drugs is increasing, uh, prevalence of diabetes is increasing. So people are living longer, but they're becoming iller uh, as their lives are uh, going longer, right? So that means more usage of drugs. Um, so in general, that setup is favorable for the market growing. And India is a reasonably interesting place because it has a very trained labor pool. So I think it definitely has a potential to grow very, very quickly. The question is, can it get its act together on infrastructure, governmental clearance and all those things? If you think the answer is yes, then I think it could be a sector that could perform really, really well. Uh, if you think the answer is no, uh, it's probably expensive, right? While the companies will still do well, they're trading at very high PE ratios and it's priced to a level of growth that is very, very strong. So really the answer is based on what your view is of government support. If you think the government is going to get around making it easier to do business in pharma for pharma companies in India, then I think there's a lot of opportunity. Okay, so there's a question on the Barosa top 150 small case. Sure. So does this mean we will exit from Divi's labs? So, uh, so what it means for sure, we will not make it a conviction pick. I'm still thinking around opportunities and basically if we were to exit from Divi's where that capital would go. Uh, because right now it's a smallish position for us. Uh, it's not a conviction pick. Um, my inclination is we will probably exit the bees this month, but still TV. Okay. So there's been a couple of uh, comments on saying that the, uh, that it was a, it was a really good dissection of API macroeconomics. Um, so that's really nice that people have appreciated it. And I think that's it. There are no more questions. Great. Uh, 
great guys and i think this is a really fun thing for us to do because you know just simply walking you guys through our own analysis helps me make the analysis better right because i'm forced to explain it to someone and when you're forced to explain it to someone you're forced to spell out your logic and that helps you also uh, create better logic um like i said there's a lot open here for judgment this is one person's view um you could look at the same analysis that was done and say hey i don't i don't know what sahil's talking about you know i think um government's going to support this in a very big way i think this market could double in you know 5 years and i think divis is going to gain share that is the beauty of investing two people can look at the same facts and come up with different conclusions it's all about making educated guesses so I encourage you to go through this analysis uh walk through the logic maybe study it yourself maybe you'll come to a different conclusion right and if you do would love to hear from you and your thoughts also you know write into us okay um, just before we leave there is one yeah. suggestion sure. that the next uh, session i mean the next next uh, yeah session advanced session should be on nbfc the housing finance space yeah that could be a very interesting one it's oh, a space so so, so nbfc and specifically housing finance is a sector that i know very well because i uh, helped set up a housing finance nbfc uh you know just a few years ago um so it's a space that we can definitely do next and it's one that's interesting also so uh let's do it we'll do a housing finance player um so let me uh, peek around for some stocks that are uh, probably interesting um to research and we can do that next i i think it's a great idea thanks for the suggestion all right that's it now. great thanks guys see you uh, next week we're going to have a beginner session next week where we're going to um, finish with insurance and conclude the personal finance session then we'll continue with the top 150 session in uh, in two weeks so great uh, good going guys and see you um see you next week bye